So for those that are not here tonight, and they say, well, what are you talking about? You just tell them it's too complicated to put into a sound bite. And that's the way I like it. I like it that way. For those folks who were like, I didn't come back because I know all about soul food. Get ready. <laughs> I'm about to hurt some feelings tonight. And that's how we rock. So um, lots of things to say and start with. I'm going to try to give you a, I don't know. A cue of some kind. A of some kind. Yeah. Thumbs up. It'll be, yeah. yeah I'll be we'll do that. We'll do that, my sister. We'll do that. So um, I don't know how many folks went with the James Beard Award, but um, there is no higher award that someone can get in the culinary world. And um, I'm going to be tooting my own horn right now because I think we need some good news in the world. Mm -hmm. James Beard isn't just a, oh, that's nice. I'm the first black person ever win book of the year in 31 years for this award. There are people who have been nominated for the James Beard six, seven times, never walked away with one. And you're in that room, the same room where, um, you know, once upon a time, Tony Bourdain, Andrew Zimmern, um, the estranged Mario Batali, um, and many great women and men, chefs and writers and authors have been and I gotta tell you, to walk across that stage twice was more than awesome because I was told when I started to do this project, nobody wants to hear it. Nobody needs it, nobody wants to hear it. You might as well hang it up. And this is not a story worth being told. Of course, if you know anything about a food memoir, which is what I write, you know, there are not that many black food memoirs. In fact, there are so few of them that I was just asked today to blurb one of my favorites in Dezaki Shange's If I Can Cook, You Know God Can from 20 plus years ago. She's releasing a new one. I'm like, wow, that's how few of them there are. Our individual lives and the tenor and the tone that they take simply have not been recorded the rate of other people. And yet, we believe that the food and our music and our culture speaks for us. And yet our young people get on Twitter. Don't, don't, don't forget about Twitter now. It's up there for a reason. So between fork bites, send some of this stuff out to the world. One of our young people tweeted today, we have no, we have no, we're so sad. We have no, uh, no culture other than hip hop we created in America. I didn't even go there with him. <laughs> I was like, look, I got a presentation, I got time for you. I'm so sorry you don't know better. But that's, that's one of the attitudes that we have. And we also have, in this time period that we're living in right now, a great celebration of our culture and a recommitment to celebrating what it means for blackness in general. And at the same point in time, my mission, my thing is, is that I want to bring Southerners of all background into one cohesive narrative of being one Southern family. And this is because we have often lived lives that have been together but apart. Our politics is based on our inability to resolve something that should have been resolved 150 years ago. And part of my work is to not continue in that vein and to denude us of another 150 year cold civil war, which we can't get our acts together. And if you can bring people to the table and have them eat together, that's one thing. But I want you to not take for granted the fact that you're in a room in Georgia, sitting side by side meeting people who, you, who not that very long ago you couldn't be in the same building with. And the people who I represent and work with in my work, the enslaved, our colonial and antebellum ancestors, really could not have dreamed of this moment. To put it in perspective for you, one of the surrounding counties next door is Jones County. My great, 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 great-grandmother is buried somewhere in the ground in Jones County, Georgia. She was given the name of Sarah. She was enslaved by the Bowen family. 
the Bowen, one of her um, slaveholders relocated his plantation to Alabama not that long before she died. Sarah was in her 90s. Her birthplace was listed as Africa. This was not a census. These were special death records. And only the most aged of the enslaved ever made it to these death records. So for the most part, if you were black, unless you were, unless you're a slaveholder and passed away, unless you were sold in your lifetime, you didn't have a vital record at all. But the fact that she was very old, the fact she had exotic origins, meant that she had her, her death recorded. And so it says Sarah died age 90, birthplace Africa. My fourth great grandparent, grandfather, John Bowen, said that both of his parents were born in Africa. He was born in Virginia. He was born in Virginia. He was enslaved in North Carolina, and so was she. And then finally Georgia, and then, and then Alabama. He died in Alabama at the age of 106. So Sarah, among all the people who are in the family tree of my book, is the only one to, to date that I can name with some certainty that made the Middle Passage. So when you ask me who created Southern food, you can talk to my fifth grade grandmother, because she was in that kitchen from Virginia to North Carolina to Georgia, where her children die in Alabama illiterate sharecroppers who could never have thought that their third great grandson would ever write a book about their lives so they would never be forgotten. This is the gravity of what we're dealing with. This is the seriousness of what we're dealing with. Food is power. Food is politics. You control a man's plate, you control his vote. You control the woman's kitchen, you control the education of her children. So therefore, the little journey we're going to take together is going to be very slanted in that way. But I want you to understand, this is the perspective from David's story, not Goliath's. So with that. So this is a enslaved person's cabin. Persons is not probably the, probably the way, right way to say it. Um, I say enslaved, I do not say slave. One is a condition, the other one's an identity. Let's get that straight. When nobody, nobody's slave. Enslaved they were, they were captives. They were captives on labor camps, that's what it was. Their p grandparents were exiles from Africa. And this particular place was a very, it's a very important spot to me. That particular cabin is one of five. Um, one is one was whitewashed and turned around the turn of the century. The rest were left as is. And the four of them, that is a four-room enslaved family cabin. That is not a couple of people per room. That's 12 people in each room. It is not a nice place. It is not, oh, it's not so bad. I've heard it all as an interpreter. Mm -hmm. Oh, this isn't so bad. Really? Wow. So, 48 human beings lived in that one building. Imagine the other buildings that used to exist there. There were over 900 people enslaved in this plantation. That's in North Carolina. On a fateful day in October of 2013, I invited a certain Southern food personality to make amends in a very quiet, safe environment. And she did not accept my invitation. She didn't get back to me at all. I wrote a letter to Paula Dean that went viral that basically said, look, the problem is that our chefs don't get any, don't get any exposure, but you can get more exposure for your past nonsense, which I'm going to shrug and just say, that's how things be. We know that. But we need to have more of a dialogue on how you can use your platform to help lift up other people who share your culture who need an opportunity. Well, she ain't never said nothing, so we don't know who she is, Miss Paula D. She, I guess she, she did what she had to do for her.
but I did what I had to do for me and my community. So outside of Durham, North Carolina, on a plantation used to have 900 enslaved people, it was once 10,000 acres. We had a dinner that we created, myself and six other black interpreters, plus a pie brigade of 10 food bloggers and chefs, plus farmers and producers from all over North and South Carolina, 40% um, of which were people of color, um, black, Latin, and Native American farmers. We created an entire 150-year-old um, dinner only using mid-19th century methods. So we have chefs call, talk about farm the table, organic, sustainable, <laughs> handcrafted. You'd have no choice in 18-something but for it to be a local, organic, sustainable, handcrafted, all of the nonsense. It was just a fact. You know, there's no such thing as other, other than that. So we did what we had to do. I stayed up 36 hours. It was the grueling thing I've ever done in my life. And at the end of that period, we had 150 people laid out. Mayor of Durham, um, Bill Ferris used to um, run the Southern um, Culture Program. Um, Old Miss, um, his wife, um, Marcy Cohen Ferris from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, there's a lot of people who've just been in this game for a long time. Randall Keenan, good authors, good poets, but just everyday people. Every religious background, every ethnic background represented on those tables. Hugh Atchison from Top Chef showed up. It was a great day. Stressful day. It was a good day. And at the end of that, we're going to do a video, but we can't do the video. At the end of that process, before people ate, my friend Gina Page called me up to the um, microphone and said, okay, it's time to get your African ancestry DNA results. And I was too tired to resist and say, okay, I want to go back on this one. And so... The result was, is that she started with my maternal line, and I swore this could go either way. If you don't know about African-American folks and DNA, when you are talking about a maternal line, you're talking about a 5% chance it's not an African woman. It could be 1% to 2% white, or the rest would be Native or Asian. When you're talking about um, males, it's a 30% chance that it is not an African man. So here I am trying to reclaim my cultural identity on a plantation, taking a very big risk. I don't know what she's about to say. And if you don't know about Gina Page, you know this for, for a fact. She doesn't lie to you. She doesn't give you the answer you want to hear. So she said, your maternal line is from a very small country in West Africa. I was like, yes. <laughs> Because I'm telling you something, that, that line, that, that particular line was known for passing. And she said, Sierra Leone, Mende people. I was like, whoa, blown out of water. And automatically, I'm going back in my mind, my great, great, great grandma was born in Charleston. Charleston was the right city. So I knew, I, I just knew how that happened. Then comes paternal, right? She goes, your paternal line these people are known for their iconography and their cloth. It's the icon of Ghana, and I just, I lost it. Because I told Gina, I said, I want to reclaim my name and my heritage and where I come from in the space it was taken from me. I don't want everybody to see this. I want y'all to record this and let everybody know it's a new day. That's what we did. And to date, I've been able to go to Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria. I'm going to Cameroon this December, Benin and Togo in March, and Sierra Leone 2020. It's my goal to go to every single country where I have genetic connections to in Africa so that I can do my naming ceremony, pour libation, repair the wounds, and move forward. And we are taking black chefs to Africa who have never been, and we're going to start doing reconciliation tours to West Africa for Southerners of all backgrounds 
starting in 2020 where we have the descendants of enslavers, the descendants of, of enslaved people, go to Sierra Leone together, go to Ghana together. And it's more just, it's not about, it's not, you know, literally, we, we're not gonna call it the guilt trip. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want you to understand something. I want you to understand that if you are a white Southerner and you don't know your African roots, and by the way, 25% of all white Southerners, <laughs> you better check your ancestry DNA. <laughs> You might find out some things. She wasn't no Cherokee princess. <laughs> that's not where you got them cheekbones from. That's, that's not why you can't fit in them jeans. And that's certainly not why you reach for that hot sauce every time a chance you get. Nope. You better know your roots. R U U T S. Okay. So, you know, I don't know why I put that picture there other than to say we got to talk about food from the alpha to the omega. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I see there's some former Pentecostals in the room. <laughs> and, some, and some excellent soft shell Baptists. <laughs> they do exactly what I meant. See, there are certain jokes. If I said, if I, when I said that in Canada, nobody got it. I'm like, what? I'm like, uh-huh, you got, no, some clubs you got to be born in. You can't just join in. All right, let's go forward. So this is, this is my world. Uh, my world isn't just talking to college groups, talking to corporate groups. Um, my world is interpretation, historic interpretation, which is different from reenactment. Stephen's shaking his head yes. Now, he may, he may or may not like the second part. Here's your primer on in reenactors versus interpreters. People confuse them. I am not a slavery reenactor. See Omarosa for that. I am not a slavery reenactor. I am an interpreter. I teach people, I woke y'all up. <laughs> Trying to get the itis. Nope, not today. Um, I'm an interpreter. I'm a 21st century person who puts on the clothes, does the tasks. I show you how things were done in the past. I answer your questions. We have a dialogue. You go home. I go home. Most likely, I'm going to go to Wawa first in my interpreter's clothes. Everybody's going to go, what? <laughs> but not in Williamsburg, because everybody knows. Everywhere you go to Williamsburg, people dress up in the funny historic clothes. But outside of that, it gets kind of weird. <laughs> reenactors and interpreters do very similar things. A lot of reenactors are more focused on military or civilian life connected to military scenes. Reenactors are a little bit more, shall we say, Devoted. <laughs> Some reenactors have been known to shoot themselves in non lethal parts of their bodies so they can have bullet wounds. Some reenactors have been known to take tape worms. Some reenactors have been known to, um, well, I'll have to give you the story because I can't just, can't just gloss over it. I bought clothes from a woman whose husband died. And his clothes fit me to a T, and I was very happy to get them. She told me all about her husband, so I figured if I buy the clothes from her for cheap, then I might as well hear the death story, too. <laughs> so her husband was quite a character, although I have not picked up any of his characteristics wearing his clothes, thank God. I swore I was going to get possessed by this man, this man in spirit. So gonna, <laughs> it's an awful movie. And he, there was a family who thought they were going to play at reenacting. There are these events called rendezvous. See, interpreters don't do this mess. We, we want to go home. We want, a, we want pizza. We want a check. That's all we ask for. You know, it's not like everybody assumes, oh, you must eat, you know, whole cake and butter beans every day. Uh-uh. Don't eat that nonsense. Are you kidding me? You better call Mellow Mushroom fast. <laughs> uh, horrible, painful shoes and scratchy linen on my back. Are you good? Uh, you better you, you try it for a week. See how you like it. <clears throat> so he said to this family, Why, what's that? And they said, it's a drainage. 
plastic drainage thing for our dishes. He walked up to me and said, here in this camp, it's always 1745. Okay, creepy men. See you later. He saw them use it again. He did not say a word. He walked up, calmly took out every dish, neatly laid it on a piece of cloth or something, took their plastic drainage thing away from them as they watched, threw it on a bonfire, and repeated himself. Here in, here in this camp, it's always 1745. Reenactive versus interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> However, both are extremely important because they both contain in their minds and in their bodies a source of knowledge about early American life that most everyday people don't have the patience or time to learn. And so both interpreters and reenactors play a very valuable role in maintaining the stories and the skills. And by the way, if you think this is like, there's always somebody to do something, forget it. In my field in cooking, we're running out of people who know how to make the pots anymore. Like we're down to like, like what, a hundred some people out of millions of human beings on the planet Earth, not just here, who know how to make cast iron, copper pots, all those utensils you see up in the living room, there's, there, you, have, you can't use those things forever, they wear down. They may not look like they wear down, but they actually wear down over time. They get thinner and thinner until they basically melt away. And they get also dust, wears away, all those things you don't think about. So we're literally running out of people who have those skills. And if you think that the war stuff is necessary, what was it, what, four years ago, five years ago, where the last victim of the Civil War, he was out in his yard, Digging for some of some, it was here in Georgia, Alabama, somewhere. And next thing you know, because people don't know how to deal with historic ammunitions. So yeah, you kind of need us for more than just you know you know how to learn about colonial underwear. <laughs> and I'm not making that up. Colonial was portrayed as an exciting program. I don't know why they thought that was going to work. Um, there's nothing exciting about colonial underwear except for the fact it's a wonder anybody had children. Um, <laughs> All right, so when we talk about this stuff, I mean, I know it's kind of like bright in here, but this is what we work with, and it's exciting because, you know, a lot of chefs talk about working with certain products, certain farms. We grow our own stuff, if, if at all possible. We source varieties that people don't know anymore. So I know that there's folks in the room who go, oh, yeah, I remember this and that. The problem is, is that your long memory, which is awesome, is about a hundred years stretch. Everybody has about a hundred years stretch long memory. In other words, if you remember something that your parents or grandparents, or great grandparents taught you, that means your memory is as long as their lifespan, give or take the amount of knowledge you've obtained from them. The 1930s is comparable, but it's not good enough. Because 1930 was very different from the antebellum period. And you see that in the WPA narratives that were collected during the Roosevelt administration. The people who are being interviewed who are formerly enslaved are now elderly. Most of them were children or teenagers or young adults during slavery. And part of their inability to comprehend the world around them is the fact the world is so different from what they knew. And even then, when they're talking to the interviewer about horses and buggies which are just starting to become obsolete. At the same point in time, there's a lot of things that they talk about the interviewer doesn't understand. For example, they, a lot, they took a lot of them from being senile. They were not senile, they just spoke a very different language. One of the things they talked about was, one man said, we raised a heap, he was from Georgia, he said, we raised a heap of rattlesnakes. The interviewer mistook him for saying literally, that they were a snake raising snakes. He's, he's old and idiotic. He wasn't old and idiotic. What he was describing was a, a watermelon that was called a Georgia rattlesnake. And the pattern on the outside looked like a rattlesnake. And so what he was saying was, Nate wasn't saying we raise snakes. He was saying we raise a certain type of watermelon that is really essential. If you, are, if you ever worked a 16-hour day in a cotton field, and I have, you know the value of refreshing fruit and water. It is so essential. 
You also know the value of that fruit in terms of now we have, we know about minerals and vitamins and things they didn't know about. It's essential. It's really a, really a, a super fruit. But they didn't understand that all these different varieties of, of vegetables and crops and foraged things, because there was a lot more wild food that was harvested than we know about today. All of them have their medicinal, cultural, spiritual values and connections. So we have peppers, we have the kushaw squash, which, um, which people don't know about anymore. That guy in the back with the stripes. It was called the sweet potato pumpkin, and it was brought from the Caribbean to North America in the 1770s. And it is basically was the only real southern pumpkin. When people talked about pumpkin pie, they didn't talk about that Halloween number. We're talking about that because, because it's a very good pumpkin for hot weather. And so from Maryland to Texas, you only saw one kind of pumpkin being used for pumpkin pie, to, to, for like baking, that was it, for 200 years. And its origin was the gardens of the enslaved from the Caribbean to the south. So we can go to the next one. 19th century cabin. This is the tip more typical than the, than the four room cabin. Logs chinking, again, 10 to 12 people, but what's that space outside of it? Can't, it's not a garden. It's a poultry yard. The poultry were not considered to be the kind of livestock that you would tithe, that you had certain taxes on. They were considered to be petty livestock. So therefore, chickens, turkeys, ducks, guinea fowl were raised for a couple different reasons. Number one, guinea fowl were the alarm clock, the alarm system. They were also used to, um, in tobacco and cotton to eat bugs off the plants. Turkeys did the same thing. Although, with turkeys that you got out of their, you know, their wonderful rear ends, a lovely fan for fanning the fire. But you also got to do, the, the, they would make quills. And so they would actually play quills, the feather quills, and make a, a flute called a quill. Um, and of course, you ate them. They provide a lot of fat, a lot of protein. They were awesome. Chickens, chickens, and geese provided feathers for pillows. We forget that there was a time when there was no polyester. All, everything soft came from feathers. You had to go around collecting feathers. And some people even had peacocks. And peacocks were actually eaten, <laughs> scary as it sounds. And when they ate them, by the way, not the enslaved, the big house, when they ate them, what they would do is they would roast the peacock then reconstruct it as if it was still alive. <laughs> Take the feathers out of it and put it back in the... In <laughs> so that when it came out to the table, it was as if it was still chirping. Yeah, not my scene. <laughs> but just so you know, this is, the, this is the reason why this whole thing about black folks and chicken, no, it was our source of empowerment. In Gordonsville, Virginia, they were actually called the, they were called the Chicken Brigade. And what they would do is, they would go to the railway, but this before there was such a thing as fast food or a railway stop. Would platters of fried chicken sell that? What did they do with that money? They bought their husband's freedom. They bought their children out of bondage. We have this attitude, this idea of these, these black folks of the past. Such shame. Uh -uh. No. They resisted slavery in every single way possible, and food was one of the nerve centers through which they became Americans. This is something we tell each of our children, because our children don't understand this. We don't understand it. We go, oh God, 12 years a slave. And what you should be focusing on is the fact that this man lived to tell his story, and if he hadn't told it, you wouldn't know where you come from. And that he was devoted to his wife and children can you imagine that? In a time when men walked off and that was it. There was nobody, no way to trace them. And he, all he could do was think about his wife and children back home. And then died not that long after he finished his book. These are my heroes. Every single one of them. Those butlers in, in Buffalo, New York, and chefs who when someone would come looking for a person who was free to, seeking their freedom. 
would hide them. And when they, when they really got on the case, they would come out to the road and line the road, arm to arm, say, cross us, see what happens to you. Well, they knew that could happen to them because they were the, the hotels depend upon them for the food and for service. And while they're lying the road in their white coats, guess what's happening behind them? Somebody's on a boat, taking them to freedom in Canada. Those are the kind of stories that we need to keep pass on because we, we're so caught up in this, I ain't no damn slave nonsense, that we forget these were not slaves. These were enslaved people who, because of them, made America live up to its promise. Different narrative. That's where the soul food starts. Soul food, African-American vernacular cuisine, I can define it several different ways. One way I define it as is African-American vernacular cuisine. Basically, it's not fancy, it's not supposed to be fancy, but it's supposed to be something that is a part of our spirit. I often tell people that soul food is the only cuisine in the world named after something transcendental, invisible, spiritual. It's about your ancestors, it's about those that are coming behind them, who will be born, it's about those who are living. It connects all three of us together. And in these spaces, little cabins like these, with maybe one or two pots, that's where the food was created. Go ahead, next one. That's where domestics lived, 18th, 18th century. One the top one is Mount Vernon. That's where his kitchen staff lived, including Hercules, who was one of the greatest chefs in early America. Hercules and James Hemings. James Hemings, who should be a household name. I'm not calling anybody out. But how many of you all know the know at least the name James Hemings? That's better than usual. James Hemings was enslaved to Thomas Jefferson. Um, he was Sally Hemings. Who's heard of Sally Hemings? Raise your hand. Okay, yeah. Okay. We we've all heard that Mari Povich story. <laughs> he was the father. <laughs> Now watch this. Sally Hemings and James Hemings were the children of Betty Hemings and John Wales. Who else might have been a child of John Wales? Thomas Jefferson's dead wife. They were half siblings. So when we talk about Southern food and DNA going together, I ain't making this up. <laughs> I'm telling y'all the real, honest to God's gospel truth. Follow me now. Thomas Jefferson's favorite meat was guinea fowl. Guinea fowl are African poultry that are ancient or brought up during the slave trade. George Washington's favorite soup was, was peanut soup. You know what they call it in one staff? They call it groundnut soup. His favorite breakfast was hoe cake. Hoke okay, was the hard, the hard tack of slavery. Robert E. Lee's favorite meal was fried chicken and black eyed peas. Robert E. Lee famously said that the savior of the Confederacy was the black eyed pea. Who are we fooling here? What instrument did Thomas Jefferson talk, wrote, basically wrote an essay about? The founding Southern instrument. What was it? The banjo. Where did he say it came from? He said, it was brought hither from Guinea with the Africans. Who are we fooling? When he wrote about peanuts, he didn't use the word peanut, he said, pandas and goobers. Who are we fooling? Whose world is this? It's a co-created world, but it's funny how half of that world you can't even see. It's, in, it's invisible. So that's important. Go ahead now. This one's kind of hard to see. Can we do the light a little bit? Because I'm struggling with this. Okay, because I really want to make sure they see this. Um, if we can. I want y'all to really see this. There, that's better. Imagine that with a pot and with a skillet, with the ashes of the fire, you create a whole cuisine that becomes a billion dollar industry in the future. What's the number one fast food brand? It's not McDonald's. It's Yum Brands. Yum Brands is KFC. KFC is the number one fast food chain in China. That alone makes it, right? And you ain't never seen nothing too. You see the KFC promotional video of like a hundred children in Beijing dressed up like the Colonel. 
I don't think anybody told him that wasn't a good look. <laughs> Y'all know what's going on here, right? You know, Chairman Mao would not be pleased <laughs> with this scene. Yeah, Y'all can forget that. Yes, beautiful. So that's North Carolina during the Depression. If I took you to Ghana right now, you see the same thing. That's the amazing part. The same exact iron pot with two, three pieces of wood and some rocks, and that's it. And a wooden spoon. And if you think about it, you know, jambalaya, hop and chon, peas and rice, Brunswick stew, gumbo, you can go on for days, okra soup. These are all one pot meals meant to feed a family that you eat with a starch, cornbread, rice, whatever. That's the story. You know. and then, you know, people think that soul food and health issues start during slavery. They don't. It's a huge myth. Number one, you didn't have access to anything that was extraordinarily unhealthy. No, there wasn't a lard issue. Lard and, and by the way, let's talk about lard real quick. <laughs> <laughs> the Jewish guy talks about lard as Shabbat comes in. Um, lard sounds unsexy. But you know what's unsexier? Partially hydrogenated soy oil that does you in three times fast. That's what should make you cringe. Um, you know... And if you don't like using the word lard, let's use the Spanish word. It's a lot sexier. Manteca. <laughs> Just say the word. Just say, let's say, are you frying that chicken in lard? No, I'm frying it in manteca. <laughs> then all of a sudden, everybody comes to the kitchen like, ooh, what's manteca? <laughs> it's a special ingredient. Because lard sounds just awful, but I'm but I'm really being serious. Cano even canola and coconut oil and no, nope. none of them are good for you. Let's put it that way. But when it comes to the list of what's gonna kill you the fastest, manteca ain't it. Because we're used to it. That's what that's where we started, right? As human beings, all we had was animal fat, and then we went to plant certain plant fats. Then we had to process the plant fats which made them dangerous when we could have just used them as a natural form. So that's the issue. Enslaved people were not given like an acre of salt. Salt was precious. Most of their salt came through salt pork and salt fish. This wasn't a sugar heavy diet because processed sugar was expensive. This is why most of you in this room who are from Georgia, your great great grandparents raised sugar cane or sorghum. Because it was easier to raise a patch, a cane, and make that into a couple gallons of molasses than it was to buy that one pound of sugar from the store. So where the where's the unhealthiness? Because people, what people do is in modern times they conflate soul food with junk food. They also conflate a celebration food with everyday food. They're not the same. That's like me going to roll up to the Olive Garden with a protest on talking about white people need to stop eating this unhealthy white soul food. <laughs> white people, I'm so concerned about your health. <laughs> stop eating the Olive Garden. <laughs> Y'all know that's not real garlic bread. It's just a hot dog with some garlic powder on it. <laughs> stop paying $5.95 a basket. <laughs> I'm trying to save your soul and your body. But every time I write about soul food for the food, oh my God, it's so unhealthy and scary and black and patho No, black culture is not a pathology. Black culture is the culture that runs this, runs this scene. That's what it is. Trust me, my grandfather, blessed memory, passed away this year at 99 years old. He's one of the founders of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives to keep black farmers on the land. My granddad left this world with one prescription drug and an aspirin every day, which he had to take dry, which I think is scary. <laughs> but my grandfather lived on okra and roasted sweet potato and fried chicken once a month and barbecue in the summer only and all that other stuff and didn't overdo it and lived off the land and knew where all of his fish came from, where his corn came from. And, and did just fine. 
didn't drink coffee for a very un unfortunate reason. He went to work one, the first time he ever worked in an integrated setting, it was him and this, this white man. He said, I don't drink coffee. So I don't drink coffee neither. Why don't you drink coffee? You know what I'm about to say. <laughs> and the white man looked at him and said, I don't drink coffee because my parents told me coffee is going to turn me black. <laughs> and my granddaddy said, I don't drink coffee because my parents told me coffee is going to turn me white. <laughs> and they became best friends. <laughs> yeah, my grandfather never drank coffee. Hominy. That's big hominy. That's the how many people ate. And yes, there's pork in that, but I want you to think about this. 15 to 16 hour days laboring. By the way, there's other myth that food has to taste good. That every meal we eat has to be nice. That, no, forget it. Nobody in the world lived that way except for the very, very, very wealthy. Nope. That's all of us. It's every single person in this room your forefathers and foremothers did not subsist on gourmet meals every day. They ate what they had, they lived with it, and that was it. The main goal was to make your stomach feel full when you went to bed at night. And that's about it. So when you think about big hominy, you think about black eyed peas and other things, these, notice these are all foods that expand in your stomach. They don't just stop when you swallow them. They keep going. Okay? Important. Next one. So we talked about Africa a little bit in my roots. Um, that's sort of some of the, well, uh, you told too fast, too fast, my sister. <laughs> they say in Nigeria, slow, slow. <laughs> so, no, why, why is this DNA thing important? Why are these family stories important? Because once, well, for most of our history, people of African descent have not been able to trace those stories. Imagine what that's like. Everybody else knows at least, oh, Italian, or oh, I'm Greek, or oh, I'm this, or I'm where from wherever. I'm Chinese, I'm Korean. And particularly for chefs, knowing what river your ancestors first saw the light of day. Knowing that they've been there since time of memorial. You don't need a family tree because they've been there so long. Although when they did Ming Tsai, um, his uh, family tree, I was so envious. Can you imagine having an accurate 2,000 year old family tree. It was so, that thing was so long, it went from one end of the room to the next. It was remarkable. And after the Cultural Revolution in China, his family was the only one whose uh, stele was not broken down and whose records weren't lost. So you could literally say, I came from so and so, came from so and so, came from so and so, back 2,000 years to the first emperor of China. Talk about jealous. We, we just trying to get to 17 something, <laughs> right? And Ming talking about 2,000 years. And some of y'all roll up talking about, should I be wearing later hosen or a kilt? <laughs> you saw that commercial. Black folks is like laughing. Every time the commercial comes out, like, oh, really? Really? So it's important because, that's fine. It's important because we not only want to understand where we come from, but where the food comes from. How can you accurately say anything about the roots of soul food being a part of the African diaspora, being a product of European, African, and native cuisines mixing, if you don't know where the African component came from? When I first started doing my work, ladies and gentlemen, I was told by some of the best of the best in the business that I had, was wasting my breath and time because there was no evidence. The reason why we, we, who the hell is we? Don't study this is because there's no evidence. You might as well hang it up. Now hold up, excuse me. Williamsburg, Virginia, don't fool yourself. The surrounding county was 70% black at the time of the revolution. 70%, why? Because just down the road at Yorktown was where everybody came off the boat. I can still take you to the exact spot, it's called um, the great, the great Valley. There's a the boat would come from and uh, up the York River from Africa. It would stop at the Great Valley. They would offload people, bring them over the ridge, clean them up, walk them in a circle to Yorktown Market. Someone would be put on boats. Someone would be sent to Williamsburg to be auctioned. 
And I was so frustrated the last time I was there. And this father said to his son, and I really wanted to get up in it. But see, I, I was like, no, not today. I can't do it. He said to his son, oh, they, there are these boxes on this, on this auction block. He goes, oh, they were selling cattle here. And I'm like, no, no, you're not educating this boy. Be real. That's not, <laughs> trust me, it wasn't cattle. But it just made me go, wow, people aren't aware. They're not trying to learn this history. But the bottom line is, is that we're going to be there for a minute. The bottom line is, is that our people, our culture, our history matter. These are not just the answers of black people. These are the cultural and genetic answers of a lot of different people, a lot of different backgrounds. And they are certainly the forefathers and foremothers of a large degree of Southern culture. So we should want to know where they come from. So to be in Williamsburg and to know that the surrounding county was 70% black, but that the city of Williamsburg was 52% black and 2% native. And on top of that, 2% other. So by the time you actually go down the row, it's only a 40 something percent white city surrounded by people who are African, native, Jewish, mixed, of all different backgrounds. And that's critical to, to think about when you go to these, some of these living history spaces where obviously the narrative is it was somebody else. When I went to Fort Snelling to do a presentation recently in Minnesota, I thought, oh, I'm just going up there to diversify the programming, not realizing that almost 40 enslaved women were there at any given time doing all the cooking in Minnesota. Not realizing that there were enslaved men and free men, and free men of color and Native American men and women working at Fort Snelling all the time. Not realizing that, that the kitchen that I was cooking in was a kitchen that was cooked in by Harriet Scott, the wife of Dred Scott. Harriet and Dred Scott were enslaved at Fort Snelling. And I'm just thinking, I'm just here to, you know, liven things up. <laughs> until I actually look at the quarters that they lived in. Knowing that this man, Dred Scott, and his wife were part of a landmark Supreme Court case decided by a Supreme Court judge from Maryland that was one of the powder kegs of the Civil War. Wow. So it's not, you can't escape it. It's not a Southern thing. It's not a Northern thing. It's an American thing. All right, that's Goree Island. That's in Senegal. Now go back to Goree, please. That's Goree Island, Senegal. It's called the Door of No Return. Um, it is one of 20 some plus, uh, what they call slave castles around Gore. It's the only one that's open for touring. And um, it's an extraordinary space. One of the things that I learned there, uh, I was very emotional because I'd never been to um, that kind of spot. I was telling Sonia last night, when you go to a plantation, you have these mixture of feelings. A lot of it's like pain and, and being just hurt and just like just annoyed and just a little anger, but also a little bit of wonder because you heard things, things trickle down to you. But when you go, but the thing about it is in your mind, you reconcile it like this. I know how the story ends. The story ends with emancipation. Emancipation goes into Jim Crow. Jim Crow goes, Jim Crow goes into civil rights. Civil rights means I'm born and, and I don't have to live that life. But when you go to slave castles in Africa, eh, it's not the same feeling. You walk in there and you know there are people who didn't make it out of there. And then you realize, you close your eyes for two seconds and you realize something. I come from somebody who held, who held it out. I come from somebody who actually had to like think about every single breath. I come from somebody who dealt with conditions I couldn't tolerate for a minute, for months. Somebody who did not know where they were going, what they were doing, but did what they had to do so I could be up here talking to you. That's the difference. And knowing that a lot of people around them did not make it. It's, it's a totally different feeling. But one of the things you learn there is that at Gore, they said to me, you know what happened when you didn't eat? You tried to starve yourself. They would feed you black eyed peas. Then they sent black-eyed peas in the slave ships as part of the, the food ration. 
and those black eyed peas were planted in the new world. See, all these things that we have that are part of our general culture, we don't realize they have deep roots. Deep roots. In New Orleans, I didn't know this. Everybody gets the Florida lead tat or earrings, not realizing that in Louisiana, when you ran away from slavery, they put the brand of the Florida Lee on you. So they knew that you were a runaway. All these things that you don't, you don't under, we don't understand that trickle down to us, that are part of a deep history. Does it make it controversial or complicated or racist or whatever? No. It definitely makes it complicated. It just means we need to have more of an idea of the context of the things in which we decorate our lives. Okay, cool. I'm going to give you a 10 minute warning because I'm going to take sure. questions. So. Sure. That's, we've got to deal with this real quick. West Africa. So, in, in a minute, I have to tell you about West Africa. So, West Africa is a, an ancient part of the continent. W those of us who are African Americans, we have the second oldest DNA in the continent. The first belongs to hunter gatherers. Like um, the Khoisan, you call the Bushmen, the Bambuti, you used to call the Pygmy, and the Hadza in East Africa. The second oldest DNA belongs to African Americans and West Africans. 70,000 years ago, our ancestors broke off from the rest of the herd and went to West Africa. So we have 70,000 years of food seeking, food creating, animal, animal and plant domestication. Okay? Keep going. And so when you go to Ghana and go to Nigeria, you go to the village, the first, and by the way, village is not a small huddle of huts. Um, that's not how it works. These are large settlements of human beings. And the first sound you hear every morning is the mortar and pestle, which and the tree is called a duh. It's, it's automatopoeia, the sound of a duh. And the thing that you notice is that the, that the younger moms have their children on their back. And they're perfectly asleep, even though this thing is making this noise. And that's how every day begins. Doesn't matter if you're in Senegal or Nigeria. To put it in perspective for you, that's like DC to San Francisco, where that's the, t the tone of life every single day. And then that motor and pestle is musical. It's not just it's not just a device for making food. See, in West Africa, people play and work and work and play. You see it everywhere you go. And so you wonder where the ball peanuts come from. They didn't come from some truck stop back in the day. <laughs> they, I saw it in Africa. They, they, that's what they do. And they sell them in the market. They fry them, they boil them, or they roast them in the, in the hot sand. Keep going. And there's the basic building blocks. The smoked uh, protein. The palm oil. So the smoked protein in Africa was fish. That became pork in the South. The fat went from being palm oil to being lard and butter. Okay? And the hot peppers and the spices stayed. The leafy greens and the starches stayed. Keep going. And so, so the idea of having that one pot meal. In this case, this is okra soup from Angola. Keep going. And that's, another, that's okra soup from Nigeria. Notice how different they are. One is chicken. One is mainly fish. Here the fufu is in balls. It's the main starch. Other places the fufu is a, is a mess. And it is no joke. Those of you ever been to Cotton and know that that is one of the most heart wrenching experiences <laughs> when you get put the first bowl of fufu in front of you and you don't know what to do with it. Because you, you don't chew fufu, you swallow it. And it's scalding hot. Uh huh. And it is scalding hot. And they give you the scalding hot soup and it's already 96 degrees outside. And you're like, okay, I don't know about this. Keep going. So, this is evidence the guinea fowl, the rice. The paintings, the still lifes, the pottery, keep going. Paintings of our people selling the food as they did in West Africa. But this is not West Africa, it's Philadelphia, Brazil, and Louisiana. Keep going. The bones in the ground. So I'm being told there's no evidence that our ancestors didn't create anything. They know there's no, nothing to show that they did anything. And yet we're surrounded by evidence. Of the fact that we're actually eating the same food they ate 30 years ago. Right? Keep going. We're surrounded by plants that reflect the fact that they had to, you know, when, you, when you're in exile, 
no matter what ethnic group you belong to, the first thing you do is say, okay, wait a minute. What around me looks like home? How am I going to make it through this? What am I going to do with myself? Keep going. So you see that. These two plants, persimmons and locusts. I remember I, the, the, the feeling I felt when I was in Ghana, and I saw the exact same tree. And I asked people, what do you use it for? It was the exact same thing you read about in WPA slave narratives. It was so thrilling because now I could actually say, document, here is the connection. Here's how this thing was used. So this is more, you know, it's like it's, it takes three lifetimes to get all this stuff down. That's why I keep going back to the continent and learning more. Keep going. Okay. But we have to deal with the fact that with slavery, it complicates things. It complicates the fact that we are going to have to talk about issues of race. On that auction block, a human being was sold every three minutes. That's from New Orleans. Okay? We have to talk about tobacco. Keep going. We have to talk about rice. Never walk around in a rice field with flip-flops. <laughs> cotton. That is, uh, every year I go pick cotton, 300 pounds. I do not intend to be a, hist a uh, armchair historian. I want people to understand and to know, and I mean business, that I did it because I wanted to experiment. My father did it because his, his father told him to do it. My grandfather did it because he didn't have a choice. My great-grandfather because he didn't have a choice. And I can tell you every single man in my family had picked cotton back six generations. And it was because of a cotton bale from South Carolina that my grandfather was able to migrate because he sold that cotton bale hopped on the back of a watermelon truck to get to the train station, got to the train station with a beautiful picture of him in a fedora and a suit, and he used that to get his first job in D.C. And when I, my grandfather, thank God, before he, long before he died, we went down to the, cotton, the last cotton gin in the county where he took his cotton to, not very far from his house, and he showed me everything. He showed me how the cotton gin worked and showed me where people lived and who lived where, who was kin to me and who wasn't kin to me, and my grandfather, says, my grandfather says to me, it was very special. My grandfather said to me, because I picked cotton, you could, you could pick up a computer and write a book. That, that meant everything to me. Because he told me, what you're doing is worthwhile, but don't forget where you come from. Okay. I'm going to do my best to... I'm not gonna totally cut it off. I gotta do. I'll, I'll make sure there's room for questions. They seem like a captive audience. <laughs> Sugar cane, Louisiana. Do you know it was that big, and it gets taller. And when you cut it, you have to be fully clothed because it is so spiky. There's so many nasty critters in there, and it's endless. <clears throat> endless. And the processing is dangerous. Keep going. And then you're surrounded by images like these. Mississippi, South Carolina. Of course, everything different in Mississippi. And I mean that with respect, because I'm there every single year, Holly Springs, doing interpretation in a town where it's now become mostly black, but still has a white antebellum pilgrimage festival. So we do a program called Back of the Big House during antebellum pilgrimage week. <clears throat> with the goal being, and it's worked out pretty good so far, we have, in, we have when I say integrated, I mean it, we have mixed groups of school children who actually come and learn about the history and legacy of black folks in the Civil War, Ida B. Wells, and enslaved cooks. So far, every single year, we, we first year was 500 kids. Last year was 1,500. Brought all from northern Mississippi to come. And for them, this is the only time they ever learn about this. And it's the only time they ever learn about this as an integrated group of students. So, yeah. I'm, I may not have, you know, broken down Mammy's cupboard. God, do I want to. <laughs> but I'm doing the best thing I can do on my side of the coin. Okay. So very quickly, that's called a punka. A punka was used to fan people at the table. At dinner, keep going. That's from Kentucky. Same device, but it's a little less elaborate. Keep going. My great-great-grandfather did that work in Virginia before he was emancipated at the age of 15. When he was emancipated... He was emancipated the 
um, morning that Lee and Grant left the McLean farmhouse. How do I know this? Because he was there. That's when he and his he and his brother received their freedom. That picture before, picture before, the most important thing on that picture is the keys and the bell. Symbols of power. Next one. We take pictures like this because we want people to understand that slavery was not a bunch of woodcuts and black and white. Slavery was as real as the lives we live today. Okay? And whenever I put on those interpreter's clothes and we go through the act of recreating the food, it is not just, okay, that's what they ate. Okay, that's interesting. That's cute. No, it's about the fact that for years you didn't see people like us interpreting with our mouths up and telling our own story. That didn't happen until Rex Ellis and Dallin Pritchett started the other half to a Colonial Williamsburg in the 80s. And now black interpreters, it's interesting. With our own folks, we got a lot of pushback. Why you want to play a slave? Why you want to be a damn slave? Excuse my language. But that's, I literally, I get, I get hate mail on Twitter all the time. You're the most embarrassing black man ever. How, you, how dare you bring us down? Who raised you? Brother, don't you know that how you dress is how you'll be treated? Why are you going to be treated like a slave? Why is there a picture of you with some biscuits in a barn? How dare you? Why do you serve white people uh, plantation food and smile? Which I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's chocolate pie. <laughs> So they don't understand. For me, this is intellectual. Keep going. We'll got two, okay, two, give me two minutes, and I got, I'll, I'll get cinch it up. Keep going, keep going. Keep going. So that's, okay, back to that picture. That's the Peyton Randolph kitchen, Peyton Randolph house kitchen. Randolph's had 27 enslaved people in the city of Williamsburg, the largest slaveholders in the city. Um, you can tell I've done this tour a million times. Um, given it, look at that kitchen. All that copper, all that cast iron, all the, all the, the, the crocs, all of it. How much skill it took to manage that. And then people will go, oh, they give the, 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 the leftover city and slave people? Not likely. The Randolphs were two people, childless couple. There were 27 enslaved people. You do the math. Not likely. But Miss Betty is in charge of that kitchen. Everybody else goes, did you see the ghost? I say, well, I see no ghost. Miss Betty, cool with me. Uh, she may not be cool with you, but she's she cool with me. I ain't never burned nothing in that kitchen. <laughs> she's all right with me. Keep going. Because me and my, my play brother Harold. And so we talk about, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, eager beaver. <laughs> she's a the North Carolina over there running. I know, I know, but guess what? They came for a sermon. <laughs> Points to anybody who can identify that green plant. Somebody in this room knows where it is. Pope? You got it. There you go. What did she say? Pope. That's Pope salad. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. There you go. Keep going. Well, now it's ain't Oprah's show, so y'all ain't gonna look beneath your <laughs> desk and find you some high rolls. They didn't. They didn't budget that in. Keep going. But look at all the different tools we have to work with. Keep going. And how and how like vibrant and how exquisite the food is. The black eyed pea fritters, the okra and tomatoes, the soup, all those different dishes. Keep going. I will proud of those chickens that day. But you know, they used to have, the thing about it is, they used to be a variety of dog. I'm not making this up. It was like a chihuahua they had in England. And the dog's job was to run around in a circle like a hamster and actually run those spits. It's called a spit dog, and they're, known, they're extinct. Isn't that kind of scary but cute? <laughs> All right, keep going. So uh, I think I'm going to round it up here and do questions, but the next three or four shots are important. It's kind of dark. Wait, wait, hold up. So stop. Yes. Okay. So North Carolina. Quail. I'm not going to remember everything. Quail stuffed with kush, which is a cornbread well, like four in our cornbread stuffing. Stale cornbread, onions, and hot peppers mixed together. Um, with, uh, 
well, they used to call it ham gravy. Ham gravy wasn't really gravy. It was the juice from, you know, pot liquor from the ham or whatever. Um, rice and peas, Hoppin' John, rabbit, fried rabbit, barbecue, fried chicken, um, vegetables from the garden. We had cinnamon squash. We had onions and corn. Keep going. And that was what I made for Henry Lewis Gates in Annapolis. And he said he was allergic to okra. And I said, you lie. You just don't like okra. <laughs> Keep going. South Carolina. Cat head biscuits. No actual cat is using cat head biscuits. But it's just the size of a cat's head. Um, and we try to make food that's seasonal that people can appreciate. Stephen has seen me do my thing at Atlanta History Center, one of my favorite kitchens. Um, we're going to be doing a big thing in October. Westville, um, but I really enjoy it because if, for, the, for the most part, <clears throat> we have younger interpreters. It's really cool to see them master the recipe and learn how to cook that way. And you know you've done something because then they go home and cook it, then cook it at home. And tradition gets passed on, you know, it's generation to generation. We were considered the best cooks in America. We weren't just enslaved cooks, we were free people of color who were, who were tavern owners who were caterers, who were internet, chefs of international renown. That's, 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 that's really important to mention. We weren't the second best chefs. We were considered the chefs. And that's why we tell this story. We want everybody to know the role that we've had in the past. And because everybody has to eat, die, and pay taxes and drink. <laughs> I, yes, I want more black folks going into farming, nutrition work, diet, being dietitians, so we can correct our health disparities in our community. I want more black folks being chefs. I want more black folks being bartenders. So we're incredible mixologists. All those tiki drinks, they're all from the Caribbean. They're all from Caribbean bartenders who never got the credit. They got nothing to do with Polynesia. They were all made in Jamaica, thank you very much. So you see, this is something we have to talk about with each other. If you don't know how African you are, you don't know how Southern you are. If you don't know how multicultural you are, you don't know how American you are. If you don't know how inter intersectional you are, you don't know how American you are. These are facts. Ain't none of y'all been the same since 1500. <laughs> Ain't none of y'all been the same since 1800. Ain't none of y'all been the same since yesterday. And thank God for that. Okay. Question time. Questions. Y'all like that's heavy. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, my grandparents and my mom and daddy. My mother was my blessed memory was my best teacher in the kitchen. My father taught me how to barbecue, of course. My grandmother, I just kind of like watched her in the kitchen for 13 years. And I'm sorry I didn't have more time. Um, my grandfather, my father taught me how to grow cotton. Although I didn't like, <laughs> my father said that when my granddaddy taught him how to plow, he like, <laughs> he was so cruel. He hooked his overalls up to the plow so he would learn the way. That's how they did it. That's how boys were taught how to plow. You would take the things from your overalls, hook it, so you didn't have a choice but to follow that one straight line. <laughs> That's right. But I'm the, but you know what the scary part is? My grandfather had 18 children. When his, at his funeral, it was funny with the, with the preacher went, now all the children and grandchildren, great grandchildren, and great great grandchildren, God's lead twenty stand up. And when they, we all stood up, the preacher, went, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> there's too many names. But I'm the only one who knows these stories. I'm the only one who can, you know, who's trying to definitely pass them down. And I know what my grandparents went through to get me here. And I know a lot of my younger cousins who showed up long she passed away have no clue. <laughs> No clue what they went through. Uh, uh But it's more than just the past. I think it's and also the, the thing about encouraging people to know things in, in the now. You know, people are excited when you teach them about things that have been forgotten in terms of food. 
People want new tastes. They want new flavors. They want to understand the world. They want to understand people better through food. So that's that's what gets what keeps me going. That's what I like about it. Yep. Yes. Yes, you need to cast iron in certain lines. And I know that was that was the main cooking utensil. Mm-hmm. And it was handmade by Blacksmiths. A group of people that did that. Yeah. And they, I know large cast iron is uh, based in Tennessee or Yep. Yeah. And I think they still handmade it. Yeah, but that's not the same. Any interpreter can tell you, lodge is cool and all, but it's not, if you brought that to a reenactor interpreter thing, you get laughed at. Not because of the label, but because it's right on their lodge. But it's passable if, you, if no one knows what you're doing. But in terms of, and, and it does, and all these things do matter, and I'm t I'll tell you why. The kind of pot you use, when you're, actually, when you're like me, you stay with all these notebooks out, and you're testing food and recipes, and you're actually looking at descriptions where people talked about the food in the past, et cetera. What you're looking for is, is this thing going to do what they said it's going to do? And what, what problems arise? How can I fix those problems? How can I so, make solutions happen? If you're not using the closest thing to what they had, then you're not able to duplicate not only the dish, but the results and the issues that result from them, the consequences. So knowing your utensils, knowing your ingredients, knowing your seasons, because we know every fish don't come out the ocean at the same time. <coughs> every bird don't fly in the sky at the same time. All these things are very important to know. You have to have in your head a, a, a calendar of garden produce. And, you know, even where I'm from, Chesapeake Bay region, there are 80 different kinds of edible fish. And they each have their specific season and time. But you draw them out the water. You know, and then, then comes the utensils. What kind of wood do you use? You know, there are about 12, 15 good hardwoods you use. And by the way, <coughs> excuse me, those hardwoods don't burn the same way. They don't have the same smell. They don't have the same, the same burning time. Red oak is different from white oak. Shag bark is different from pig nut hickory. And this is only because this is like a, it's a, it's a lot of stuff you got to learn and have in the back of your head when you do this stuff. So yeah, there's a lodge in the place to make cast iron, but there, there's the cast iron of the 18th century. There's cast iron of the 19th century. And those will affect how you make, how you go about the act of replicating that cuisine. Yep. That's a good question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Talking about your, your grandfather and how he ate. You mentioned something like celebration food. Right. He ate something only once a month. Or yeah, you yeah, fried chicken with Sunday dinner kind of stuff. Not yeah. So so we talk about that in the context of African American health disparities now. Mm -hmm. that, that we want the fried chicken every day. Right. Here it, it, it comes less from that the fact that we learned how to eat foods that we were actually not accustomed to. Um, white bread. That wasn't really a thing. It was called seldom during slavery. That, that's how often you had it. That's why it was called seldom. A biscuit was like a super treat, right? Some people had Sunday biscuits. They had a ration of Sunday, a flour and soda to make biscuits on Sunday. Some people never had it at all. Some people only ate one biscuit once a year. Some people ate it every week. Slavery was colloquial and discretionary. But it wasn't the, the people and their mindset about their food. It was their need to assimilate. Of the 10 healthiest diets on the planet right now in 2018, eight of them, from, eight of them are from West Africa. Let's think about this. So you mean to tell me of the 10 healthiest diets, we ain't even got to 20 yet. Tenor from West Africa, what the hell happened to us? <laughs> you should want to know. Well, first of all, when you go to West Africa, a couple things go on. Number one, plant-based diet isn't even a thought because that's just the way things are. 
that's how you eat and how you live. Second thing is people don't people aren't into sweet stuff. Sweet stuff is fruit and sugar cane. That's it. Um, there are some places like Senegal where the French have been, but that's really for special company. You know, they have their. The, 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 by the way, they make the best pastry. They make the best pan chocolat. Oh my God! I've been to France twice. And I've been to Senegal. Well, I'm tell you something. They blackify them croissants. <laughs> <laughs> Lord. But then you realize that that's not the traditional food, right? So my thing is this. I think all Southerners, but especially black folks, the problem, why are we in such a deficit? With, during Reconstruction, we started to adopt foods, eggs, white bread, salt, sugar from the store, all this store-bought stuff, right? It's not that, that simple, but it is that simple. Um, dairy became more part of our diet. And we're not a dairy people, for the most part. We're 70% lactose intolerant. Gluten is the biggest issue of all. I'm not, a, I'm not one of people that goes, oh, gluten-free, that, that, that's no. I want you to hear me out, though. I said, we, we've been cooking and doing our own thing for 70,000 years. What happens after 70,000 years? You, you pretty much survive on yam, cassava, sweet potato, rice, millet, uh, sorghum. All these foods are non-glutinous. And then all of a sudden, somebody hands you wheat. Some that you have the least of every of all the people on earth, sub-Saharan Africans have the least gluten tolerance, which means when we put wheat into our bodies to this day, it, it creates havoc. Which is not me saying never eat bread. It's me saying know that for you, this is as bad as milk. It's not your food. You should do your best to avoid it. Um, and what happens when gluten and flour and those kind of carbs are processed in the body? Chronic illness, inflammation, diabetes, cancer, heart disease. Salt, talk about salt really quickly. You may know this already. Um, people don't think that, that racism can affect the body. Uh-huh. So one of, the, one of the most important studies that ever was done talks about hypertension in African Americans. You gotta remember something. Every single enslaved African who got on that boat was hand selected for vibrancy, for healthiness, but also the, those folks who were less likely um, to sweat as profusely. And then when they taste it, they put someone actually go up into you and taste the sweat. There are many images of this. Slave traders actually licking the face of Africans. What are looking for? Looking for the presence of saltiness in their sweat. If so, you ain't the best candidate. But those who retained more sodium were able to survive longer. So you think about this. It created a genetic bottleneck where every single person put on those boats within one generation passed on a trait of hypersensitivity to sodium. They got passed down to us. So the very thing that kept our ancestors alive is a thing that makes us have to watch every ounce of sodium put into our bodies for our entire lives. So it's deep. It's all these different layers. And we'd have more of a conversation about it. We just, we'd also make sure we don't shame folk for what they eat, and re-educate ourselves. Because we can't all be Dick Gregory. We can't all be Elijah Muhammad. We tried that. We can't all be my friend Brian Terry, who's a vegan, black vegan chef who makes excellent food. But we can incorporate those foods and those paths and patterns of how we eat on a regular basis. Remember to drink our water. Remember to not reach for the salt as often as best we can. To, to incorporate more seasoning flavors into our food to raise our children differently. Um, but also not, not accept the idea that black food is a pathology. No more than black music, black literature, black, mu black dance, none of it. That, that's not helpful either. Because a lot of times people who don't have, no matter what color you are, background you come from, it ain't about you know, your mindset. It's about the fact that these are, the, these are cheap in, in our culture. 
where people don't have no money or no resources, these are easy ways to feel good. And sometimes as a parent, that's a way out. And as a child, you pick that up too. You grow up, you go, I want to feel good. I need something that makes me feel quick, instantly happy. But then as you grow older, you learn that instantly happy often translates into inflammation. It makes you feel not so good. And it's a lifelong struggle. You know, everybody wants me to write every single recipe B. Super, super healthy vegan vegetarian. My favorite question is, do you have any vegetarian slave recipes? <laughs> First of all, oh, it gets worse. When the time I was asked, do I have any recipes for slave tapas? <laughs> Isn't that deep? <laughs> so yeah, I'm telling you, it was a college, it was up north, and they wanted me to do this thing, and they said, do you have any slave tapas? And I was like, I can't with y'all, bye. <laughs> Shut it down. So it's just, it's just a learning process, and we're not the only community that has this. That's the, that's the thing we need to think about. Quick, finish your, quick, uh, answer your question. Look what happened in the Hawaiian community. A group of Hawaiians said, we got all this spam and, and bread in our diet, and we are dying. So they said, let's go back to taro. Let's go back to fresh seafood. And it, without a single pill, for most of them, especially young ones who could reverse the trends, all this started going backwards. My friend Sean Sherman, who literally calls himself the sous chef, he is Lakota and Dakota. He only makes indigenous food. If it wasn't here before uh, Columbus, he don't, he don't make it, with the exception of lamb with the, with the Navajo dishes. But he literally will not put extra salt in his food that's not natural. He won't put other sugar in his food. It has to be maple syrup and honey. He, will, he doesn't use coffee and tea for natural stuff. He's literally reteaching Native Americans how to eat the way they did in, in 1492. And he's saving lives. So, yeah. What's his name? Soup yesterday with no salt. It was the worst thing. <laughs> <laughs> sea, a little sea salt, not no salt. Yeah, not no salt. Please don't do that. And also, we did, right, right. And we have to remember something that we can't live without salt either. That's the that's the catch twenty two. All right, so one last question, and that's it. Okay, I will give that to your husband, sir. You kind of touched on earlier some of the history about the phrase "let's break bread." Yeah. And some of the history behind that quote, as well as. Uh, while they were eating at the, at the table back in the day, most of the conversation over the years you heard them have at the dinner table, at the table over there. So one of the things that got me was um, one particular experience I had in uh, Mississippi, in Natchez. And um, why can't I think of the man's name right now? It should be in the front of my head. Who was the gentleman who integrated Ole Miss? James Murdoch was there that day. Like out of nowhere. Hi, James Murdoch. <laughs> and um, it was a group of folks from all over the community, white and black, and Native American, Choctaw. And he's laughing and talking. Everybody's making food together. And, I, and one of the white ladies said to me, pulled me on the side and said, this is the largest integrated gathering we've ever had. In Natchez, it was 2012, and it just—it really hit me. This is this is not easy work. This is very complicated work. It's also uh, necessary, and that comes up pretty frequently. People sort of like say things that and admit things that they ordinarily felt uncomfortable to do so. But they express their truth. And if we can have more of that going on, I've never had a fist of cuffs at one of my dinners. <laughs> but one thing I have had is I've seen people transform. And I've seen people grow. And I've also seen people just kind of like take a moment to shut their mouth and realize there's a whole other side to life that they never had the chance to think about. You know, 
we 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 can we can have positive change without people essentially losing their personal truth, but also connecting the truth to the fact that the matter is we are one human family and one southern family. Thank you.